good to see everybody here. We're on our last lesson of this quarter. We're going to be starting a new quarter. We got new books back there uh, by the camera stand. So, yeah. So be sure and pick you one up before you head home so you can be studied up for next week. This is our last lesson on the Gospel of Mark. Jesus' death and resurrection is the title of our lesson this morning. Folks, let's do as we normally do. Let's go to the Lord. Each and every one of us pray in our own way. And just ask the Lord to send His Spirit to lead us into truth this morning. Let's go to Him. Dear Heavenly Father, God, as we come to You this morning, Father, we thank You so much for Jesus' death and resurrection. Lord, that makes it possible for us to be saved. Lord, and we place our faith and our trust in Him this morning as we study Your Word. God, we just ask that You would help each and every one of us. Lord, to understand Your Word, to receive Him into the, our hearts, Lord, if we have not And it's in Jesus' name that we ask it. Amen. Amen. Our study text this morning is, of course, the last chapter of uh, the last chapter plus a little bit of the fifteenth chapter of Mark. Our central truth is Jesus is alive, and what a truth that is this morning. Our key verse this morning is Mark sixteen and six, and it says, "Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. Behold the place where they laid him." Our learning objective this morning to help students recognize and appreciate that Jesus was the suffering servant and the Savior of the world as shown by his actions. Also to challenge students to endure joyfully any persecution or opposition that they experience for their Savior. And th third, to encourage students to recognize and understand that suffering is part of what it means to identify with Jesus. It's just part of what it means to identify with Christ. Him and His suffering. Today we're concluding our study of the book of Mark. One of the themes that we've observed is the authority of Jesus. Today we see His authority demonstrated as He willingly laid down His life, then took it up again by rising from the dead. And that's one thing that we will be discovering this morning is the truth that He laid it down. It was not taken from Him. He did not die of physical weakness. As a matter of fact, the first Gentile to give a testimony of his belief was that Roman soldier that said when he heard him cry out in that loud voice which proved that his body was not even weakened. He cried out in a loud voice when he said that it is finished. And that's how he, that Roman centurion said this truly is the Son of God. But as we look at the people involved in his death, it's important to remember that the plan of God from the foundation of the world was for Jesus to be the sacrifice for lost humanity. That fact, however, does not detract from the choices that each individual makes, whether to serve God or to reject Him. Whether to serve God or reject Him. Our opening activity requests that we take testimonies. I know myself uh, of what Jesus' death and resurrection means to us. I know His death and resurrection means to me that I know that through studying his word and knowing the facts around his death and his resurrection builds my faith to the extent that I truly, truly believe that he is risen and therefore I can put my faith and trust in him that he's going to take care of whatever comes my way even if it be death that I will rise to join him in that day. Does anybody else want to share a testimony this morning? Yes. Temporal, that's right. Yes. What you know, what if we didn't have that have that hope? That blessed hope. Anybody else? If not, we'll move along. Each person must choose his or her response to the death and the resurrection of Jesus. As we look at today's lesson. Examine the characters involved in the choices that they made. Which ones do you identify with at different times in your life? I know I can identify with several of them and the way that they responded. 
folks, the facts are that they didn't respond with very much faith in the beginning, did they? When they went in and found that empty tomb. Some of them wanted to get out of there pretty quick before they got accused of stealing his body even. But each one has got to choose a response. Jesus knew that he would be exalted in the divine plan of salvation. The same plan that brought him to the cross. The familiar story of Christ's death and resurrection can bring us comfort regarding God's plans for us. Whatever we're expecting now, excuse me, whatever we're experiencing now, good or bad, we ought to recall the future that God has made possible through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Let us ask God to help us maintain the attitude of Christ as we await our future hope. And we're going to begin reading in Mark 15. Verses 16 through 20, beginning in Mark chapter 15, verse 16. It says, And the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole band. And they clothed him with, with purple, and plaited a crown of thorns, and put it about his head, and began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him on the head with a reed, and did spit upon him, and bowing their knees, worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him, and put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. Now people go to great lengths to show honor to earthly kings and dignitaries, yet the king of kings was the object of mocking and beating. Most people have endured some kind of mocking in their lives, perhaps as, as far back as elementary school. Often those memories are painful even to adults. Sometimes they never, you never forget those things. But the mocking that Jesus received from the Roman soldiers was far more painful and humiliating. He chose to accept it, not because they were more powerful than he and kept him there, but because this was part of God's plan to bring salvation to the world. Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, had bowed to the will of the crowd, who insisted that Jesus be crucified. He released to them Barabbas, an insurrectionist, and ordered his soldiers to flog Jesus, a punishment that sometimes proved fatal at the hands of the Romans. In addition to being flogged, Jesus was subject to other painful and humiliating treatment as he fa faced an entire company of Roman soldiers called together to mock him. Probably about 60 of them. In a mock coronation ceremony, the soldiers dressed Jesus in the royal color purple. And they placed a crown of thorns upon his head to mimic the laurel wreaths worn by the Caesars. The Greek word used for that crown. Stephanos. Meant victor's crown even though they didn't know. But that word that was used for it meant victor's crown. And he was. He was a victor. He was victorious. They were, uh, they saluted him with the words, Hail the King of the Jews. In the same way that Caesar's guard hailed their master. Repeatedly they struck him, spit on him, and paid homage to him. I mean, they would, they would strike him and spit on him and then bow, bow down to him and in mock worship pretending to honor him as a prince or a king you know folks and, and believe it or not the irony of the fact that they were doing this and the truth is that he was the king of the Jews and not only the king of the Jews but the king of the world which they would soon recognize in the kingdom age and will the Jewish people as well as the world will recognize him as king in that age, in that time. And I'm talking about the kingdom age. When he was an infant, Jesus' identity as king was revealed to the Magi. As an adult, Jesus avoided the people's attempt to make him king by force. He also rejected Satan's temptation to rulership, which would have required him to bow down to Satan himself. Jesus held all authority in heaven and on earth. But in God's plan and timing, he must suffer the crucifixion. Questions. 
How will Jesus help us when we are ridiculed for our commitment to him? How is he going to help us when we're ridiculed? Folks, that knowledge. Just like Sister Verda said, that knowledge of knowing that it's temporary. That knowledge of knowing that Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. So likewise, if we're not ashamed of him and we stay true to him amid mocking and persecution and things that the world send our way, God notes these things, doesn't he? What are some situations in which we especially need to trust in God's perfect timing despite the challenges? What are some things, some situations in which we especially need to trust God's perfect timing? So many times things look bleak and to our eyes and in and, and no better way than we have of explaining things in this temporal world when we think there's no hope. But yet we know that He is the source of our hope. The source of our faith. And He was insulted by unbelievers. Let's read verses 21 through 32. It says, And they compelled one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country of the, fa the father of Alexander and Rufus to bear his cross. And they bring <clears throat> him unto the place Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a skull. And they have him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. Which, that would be 9 a.m. The Jewish day begins at 6 a.m. Verse 26, And the superscription of his accusation was written over the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two thieves, the one in his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled with which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others, himself he cannot save. In verse 32, let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. And the suffering of Jesus continued and escalated as he was taken to the place where he would be crucified, as he was mocked by the Roman soldiers and the chief priests and the teachers of the law. He could have called down an army of angels to free him even as his enemies challenged him to do just that. We can scarcely comprehend the love of God that kept his plan in motion. The soldiers forced Simon, a Cyrenian, who had likely come to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration to carry Jesus' cross. Cyrene was a port city in what is now the nation of Libya. The identification of Simon's son by name means, seems to indicate that early readers of Mark's gospel would be familiar with them. In Romans 16 and 13, Paul mentioned Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Jesus was brought to the hill called Golgotha, the place of the skull. I was reading it, this talking about this place of the skull. There's two, there's two explanations or two meanings about why maybe that this place was called the place of the skull and nothing as far as scriptural uh, all we know is that it was called the place of the skull we don't really know why positively that it was called the place of the skull but one of uh, in Hebrew I guess maybe tradition it was said that 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 was where Adam was buried and they had discovered where Adam was buried and had 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 discovered his skull there that's one of them the other one is that maybe that the the face of the mountain there formed the cliffs and the bluffs in that area formed something that appeared to be a skull it's probably the latter uh, is maybe why it was called the place of the skull but he was offered 
a mixture of wine and myrrh. Myrrh is a spice taken from plants growing in, a, in Arabia and Africa. This drink was given by Jewish custom to those about to be crucified to dull the pain. Jesus refused to drink it, choosing rather to experience the agony of the cross unaided by a painkiller. Fully conscious. Fully conscious of what he was doing and what was taking place. I think that's why Jesus chose not to take it. In addition to physical agony, Jesus suffered insult. The soldiers divided his clothing and gambled for it. This is not only reflected in Roman custom, it fulfills Psalm 22 and 18, which foretold these things. Further, his identity as king, twisted as a charge against him, was posted for all to see. As a matter of fact, if you look in verse 25, it says, and it was the third hour and they crucified him. One of the things that I noticed in the commentary that I was reading on this chapter, it says, and it was the third hour and they crucified him. Well, we've already mentioned it, that that day, the Hebrew day, and they, it began at 6 a.m. So it was the third hour and they crucified him. That was 9 a.m. And I don't think it was any coincidence at all, folks, that 9 a.m. was the time of the morning sacrifice in Jewish tradition. That was the time of the morning sacrifice. To further dishonor him, Jesus was crucified between two criminals and he had that sign over the cross that said the king of the Jews and you know Mark doesn't really say anything about it but the other gospels some of them record that it you know that bothered the the Pharisees and it bothered the 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 Jewish council they they wanted him to change it and say and put up there he says he's the king of the Jews but Pilate Pilate had written it with his own hand and he said, what I've written, I've written. And he wouldn't change it. So it's fitting that he was crucified with the truth proclaimed above the cross. And it said, King of the Jews. And not only the King of the Jews, but the King of the world. To further dishonor him, Jesus was crucified between two criminals. This fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah 53 and 12, that he was numbered with the transgressors. Some witnesses repeated the accusation that Jesus said that he would destroy and rebuild the Jewish temple. Of course, we know we've studied that. It was, I think maybe it was, it was either last week or the week before that he wasn't even talking about the Jewish temple. He was talking about the temple of the Holy Spirit. He was talking about his body that would be destroyed and raised up in three days. The religious leaders mocked him for not delivering himself as he had others. Like others who mocked, who mocked him, they challenged him to free himself from the torture that he was suffering. But you know, folks, had he saved himself, no one else could have been saved. Had he, he could have called 10,000 angels to come, as the old song says, to come and to, to free him. But had he, had he saved himself, no one else would have been saved. It is a proof of God's love. You know, there's another old song that it was love that held him to the cross. It was love that held him to the cross. But they challenged him to free himself from the torture that he was suffering and alleged that they would believe if he did so. They lied. They, they told him to, you know, free yourself, bring yourself down from the cross and that we may believe. They were lying because he, was, he rose again in three days and they still didn't believe. They wouldn't have believed had he freed himself. Why do you suppose that Jesus rejected the pain-numbing offer of wine and myrrh? Why do you think he rejected that? I've already stated I really believe it's because he wanted to be fully conscious of what was going on and not to be numbed or put to sleep by anything like that what would you say to those who mocked Jesus as unable to save himself having saved others folks it took a lot more love and a lot more determination to stay on that cross than to call 
10,000 angels to free him. Jesus dead and buried. Let's read verses 33 through 41. And it says, And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So that would have been until from noon. The sixth hour would be noon. And the ninth hour, of course, would be three o'clock. Three in the afternoon. Verse 34, And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, la masabachthani. Which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he calleth Elias, or Elijah. They misunderstood. They thought he was calling Elijah. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink saying let alone let us see whether Elias will come and take him down and Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost and the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom and when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost he said truly this man was the son of God there were also women looking on afar off, among whom was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James, the less, and of Jones, Joses, and Salome, who also, when he was in Galilee, followed him and ministered unto him, and many other women which came up with him into, unto Jerusalem. And now, well that's verse 41. This is the moment for which Jesus had come to earth had arrived. He was hung on the cross. He was the sacrifice, the Lamb of God, who had come to take away the sins of the world. At that moment, he was, in a, in a, in a way we cannot understand, separated from the Father, not because of his sin, for he was sinless, but because of ours, because of our sin. Now from noon until three in the afternoon on the day of Christ's crucifixion, the land was covered by darkness. Now a lot of people, I don't know, I think they've even searched down through history and they've searched down through uh, maybe the, whatever they call the records of the solar system and tried to say that there was a, an eclipse during that time. But actually, from what I've read, and one of the commentaries talked about, uh, there couldn't have been an eclipse because it was a full moon at this Passover feast that they're talking about here. And a full moon, an eclipse doesn't happen. An eclipse only happens during a new moon. We're talking about a total solar eclipse where I'm talking about where it's dark in the middle of the day. So this is not even explained by a natural eclipse. It was dark because God wanted it dark. It was dark because he had turned his back on his son because of our sin. Uh, history records that it was, they knew it was dark as far as southern Egypt and a lot of those areas, but around. But uh, I'll be real honest with you, I figure it was dark over the whole world at least that was daylight at that time that it was dark over the whole world but then Jesus cried out and when he cried out my God my God why have you forsaken me Eloi Eloi lama sabachthani this was the phrase take spoken in his native Aramaic language that meant, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Aramaic is a Semitic language similar to Hebrew that slowly became the language of the Jews after the exile. There is no way the human mind could grasp the significance and the anguish of what would be involved in the Father's alienation from the Son. Since we cannot grasp the nature of one true God in Trinity. 
So we don't know the agony that he was actually going through at that time. Some mistook Jesus' words as a plea for Elijah, the prophet, to come and save him from the cross. In response, someone offered Jesus sour wine, the common drink of the Roman soldiers, and encouraged others in faith, or perhaps sarcastically, to watch for Elijah to appear. The manner in which Jesus died with a loud cry convinced the centurion overseeing his crucifixion that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. He didn't die of physical weakness. Had he been that close to death, he wouldn't have, in physical, of physical weakness, he would not have been able to crowd in that loud, clear voice that he did. Folks, he laid down his life willingly willingly matter of fact it says that the manner that he died with a loud cry convinced this centurion seeing his crucifixion that Jesus was indeed the son of God despite the torture of the flogging the walk to Golgotha and the hours of hanging nailed to the cross Jesus had the strength to cry out in this manner at that moment, the, the, the curtain separating the holy place from the most holy place in the Jewish temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom, and that's significant too. Being ripped in two from the top to the bottom. And they said that this, this veil, this curtain that they're talking about here was woven and that it was so strong that uh, even a huge team of horses could not have torn it which proves that it was an act of God and this event signified that the barrier between people and God had been broken we can now enter the holy of holies and come into God's presence before that time a priest was only allowed to go in there once a year to make sacrifice for our sins and he had to be cleansed in certain ways before he could even go in there into the presence of the holy of holies without dropping dead Mark records that a group of women watched from a distance and the group included Mary Magdalene whose life had been radically changed when Jesus expelled seven demons from her so folks we think about it and we think about Christ's death and we know that of course unless he raptures the church out and until he does if we're not here when it happens then one of these days death is going to overtake each and every one of us I think it was old Ben Franklin said there's two things that are a sure thing <laughs> and that's death and taxes now I'm inclined to agree with him but we know for sure that death it is a sure thing but we can know because of this thing that we're talking about here Christ dying on the cross him taking those sins upon him that gives us hope it's no longer like when a, when a Christian dies it's no longer like well the light is extinguished he's dead now it's more like the light is bit, the lamp's been put out because it's dawned because it's got daylight outside and we don't we don't any longer need it why is it necessary to realize that only God could break the power of sin over our lives right if we could have done it ourselves Jesus would have died in vain wouldn't he and also the, another reason that we need to realize that only God can break the power of sin in our lives is to realize and not put our faith in anything other than him because you'll hear it preached and you've heard it there are many ways to God I know I always like to bring up Oprah but she stated it right out <laughs> and so many people follow her and listen to her in this modern day she was one of the voices that oh there's many ways to God folks it is very important that we believe that only God can break the power of sin we as humans have sinned and each and every one of us have and it is very important to realize and know the fact 
that only God can save us from those sins. Why does a miracle of deliverance or healing often strengthen us in our fellowship with Christ? Why does a miracle of deliverance or healing? Well, folks, especially if He delivered us, if He changed our heart, we realize and know as well as I do. Before I was saved, I enjoyed different things than I do now. My nature was changed. Just like <laughs> Brother Watson was talking about the other day, our nature is not the same as it was. You know, talking about that sow that was washed and cleansed. I'm talking about scrubbed clean. You turn it loose, what does it do? It heads right straight back for the mud hole, doesn't it? And Waller's in that mud. It's that because that is its nature. You know, when I feed hogs, a lot of times, I, in which I always soak their corn down for them and let it set in there for two or three days, I've got several buckets sitting. And each day I, when I fill up a new one, I've got it on one end, and I take the one that's been soaking for several days and any other scraps that Don has dumped in there on top of it. And by the time that gets soured up, nice and bubbly and everything, where those hogs are really enjoyed, I'll dump it out in that trough. I'm telling you, there ain't no way that I could get down there and put my snoot in that trough <laughs> where that hog is eating. Why? It's not, yeah, it's not in my nature. It's not in my nature. But that hog, I can't even hardly keep them out of the way till I get it dumped in the trough. That's how ready they are to put their snoot in that old soured up mess. So folks, I'm going to tell you something. If you can get down in the trough of this old world and all the things that it has to offer and all of the stench and all of the filth that goes on, if you can get yourself right down to that level and enjoy it just like everybody in this world, then your nature's not been changed. There is a change of nature that takes place. Is a change of nature. Then there was a bold request. Let's read verses 42 through 47. And it says, Now, when the even and when the even was come, because it was the preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath. Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counsel, counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. And Pilate marveled if he were already dead. Calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether he had been any while dead. And when he knew it of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. And he bought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in the linen and laid him in a sepulcher which is hewn out of a rock and rolled a stone onto the door unto the door of the sepulcher. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph beheld where he was laid. They saw where he was laid. Two rather unlikely people who were actually members of the Sanhedrin took the bold action of burying the body of Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea had become a believer and had not consented to the death of Jesus. Nicodemus, who had earlier come to Jesus under the cover of night, assisted Joseph. Both were prominent men who risked their reputations, if not more. They might have even risked more than their reputation to identify with Jesus in this way. Mark explained that Jesus' death took place on a Friday, which was the day of preparation before the Sabbath. Therefore, it was necessary that Jesus' body be taken down and buried before the Sabbath began at sunset. Performing this task was Joseph of Arimathea, called a prominent member of the council, that is, the Sanhedrin. Jesus' message that the kingdom of heaven was at hand resonated with him, and he didn't consent to the Sanhedrin's decision to condemn Jesus to death. When asked for the body of Jesus... Pilate was surprised that he was already dead. Crucifixion was a slow means of execution and it could take days 
for the condemned to die. Pilate called for the centurion in charge of the crucifixion who could bring confirmation of Christ's death. And when he told him that he had died, then he released his body with the help of Nicodemus. Joseph took Jesus' body, wrapped it in linen with myrrh and aloes and placed it in Joseph's own tomb. The boldness and the willingness of Joseph and Nicodemus contrasted sharply with the fear of Jesus' closest followers who were nowhere to be found when it was time to bury him. You know, I know God had this all planned out, but it does seem kind of ironic, doesn't it? That his followers that had been with him in his ministry and that he had told, I, I will rise again. They were nowhere to be found. They were hidden, hiding from the authorities in mourning of Christ's death. But yet those few, only two as far as we know of, of the council that believed they took care of his body for burial. Mark also added that two women who had followed Jesus saw where he was laid, a detail important for the verification of events to follow. Now Mark explains Jewish customs for his Gentile readers. What things about your faith may need to be explained to non-Christians? Or are there some things that you, may, that you think may be, need to be explained to non-Christians? Especially when you're witnessing to them. Of course there are. They don't understand anything as far as, as your spiritual life if they haven't studied God's Word or if they haven't been in contact with God at all spiritually or physically or, you know, I'm talking about things that they won't know. How can your boldness as a believer impact the lives of those who do not know Jesus Christ? When you approach those things in, the, in a certain way, uh, something tragic happens maybe in your life and you pray. You state your faith in God. These people who would fall apart and they realize that there's a difference. And pretty soon people maybe that are even around you and they see how you react to these things. And they might even come to you seeking help and ask you to pray. These are how the believers boldness and the things that they do impact unbelievers and those who don't know Jesus Jesus resurrected and ascended let's read the first eight verses of Mark 16 it says and when the Sabbath was passed Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had brought sweet spices they might, that they might come and anoint him and very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment and they were affrighted. And he said unto them, he saith unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There you shall see him as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. The plan of God continued to unfold. As some of the women who had followed Jesus went to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body after the Sabbath. Although Jesus had said he would rise again, the women fully expected to find the body of Jesus right where Joseph and Nicodemus had left it. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had quickly wrapped and buried the body of Jesus before the Sabbath began. Then the day after the Sabbath was when Mary Magdalene and two other women came to anoint the body of Jesus with the spices that they had purchased. This was part of the burial process at that time and was done to offset the odor of decomposition. And you think about it, just by them coming to do this, and by purchasing these spices because they were very expensive. 
that does let us know as the commentary suggests it does let us know that they really didn't believe he was going to rise again had they really believed that he was going to rise again on the third day as he had plainly told them they wouldn't have wasted their time and money to went and got those spices to anoint his body the women were concerned about the massive stone there you go there's another reason they were so worried about that stone and who was going to move it for them they were worried about the massive stone that had been placed in front of the entrance of the tomb on their arrival they saw that the stone had been rolled away and that the tomb was occupied by a young man in a white robe identified elsewhere as an angel of course in the gospel of Matthew but this angel told the, the women not to be afraid and continued by repeatedly affirming the good news that Jesus was alive. Jesus had risen. He was no longer in the tomb. And in the early morning light, the women were invited to see the stone slab where Jesus had been placed, which was now empty. The angel gave them a mission. Tell Jesus' disciples that the risen Christ would meet them in Galilee. In doing so, he singled out Peter, who had previously denied Christ. was not the only one who acted in fear. Peter was not the only one. Hesitated at first to share that Christ had risen, but later proclaimed his good news. And folks, I tell you, you know, I've heard people say, well, the reason they said go and tell the disciples, tell my disciples and Peter, is that Peter was not a disciple at that time because he had denied him. But if you remember last week or week before, whenever it was, we studied this, and Peter did. He did because Christ told him that he would, and he denied him three times before the rooster crowed. But if you remember, when it dropped off talking about Peter at that time, it says Peter wept bitterly. And I really think that Peter at that time repented. I honestly think that Peter repented. And I believe myself... I believe that the reason he said my disciples and Peter and singled Peter out was because to make sure that Peter knew that he was included. To make sure that he knew that Peter was included having repented. Because he did repent. Because what do you think the enemy would be? What does the enemy do when you first repent? He's going to come and tell you, ah, oh, God's not going to forgive you for that. Look what you've done. You're not going to be forgiven. And I really believe that that's the reason Peter was singled out rather than at the time that Peter was not. Because think about it. What did Peter do? Peter preached that first sermon after the Holy Spirit came. And how many thousands came to the Lord? And he preached with the power and authority of the Holy Ghost. Why do you, I like this question here. Why do you suppose that angels in Scripture often began speaking by saying, Fear not? Or be not affrighted is what they said here. Why do you think they usually say be, <laughs> fear not? Why is that usually the first word out of their mouth? Huh? Well, Matthew, uh, Matthew when Matthew uh, told the story, and he was talking about the angel, he said that he had a, a countenance like lightning. How would you react if you saw a person that had a countenance like lightning? You'd be a, I'd be scared, I think. And I believe that's why they usually, that's usually the first words out of their mouth when they appear, is be not afraid, fear not, be not affrighted. What are some ways that Mark 16 teaches us about God's love? What are some ways that the 16th chapter teaches us about love? Well, one of the ways, you know, I already talked about it. It teaches us about love because he stayed on the cross. He didn't rescue himself. He showed love to Peter. There's another way that he showed love, yes. When he singled him out. Right.
Sure. Yeah. Sure. This was an example, wasn't it? This was the ways that he that he showed love. Go and tell. Let's read verses 9 through 20. It says, Now when Jesus was risen, early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been, that, that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And this is talking about the, his disciples. Verse 11. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. They didn't believe her. Verse 12. After that he appeared in another form unto two men, unto two of them, as they walked and went unto the, unto, into the country. And they went and told it to the residue, and neither believed they them. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven, as they sat at meat and upbraided them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he, he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere the word, the Lord, excuse me, working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Now the resurrection of Jesus changed everything for his disciples. Begin the, beginning with his appearance to Mary Magdalene and later to others, they became the messengers through whom the world would hear the greatest news ever. The greatest news ever shared. That news would be accompanied by signs and wonders. Mark records an appearance, an appearance of Jesus to Mary Magdalene alone. Mary's report to Jesus' disciples was met with unbelief. Likewise, the experience, experience of two disciples who encountered, encountered Jesus walking to Emmaus was met by unbelief. Skeptics have argued that the disciples expected that Jesus would be resurrected and that these ex expectations created the illusion that he was indeed alive. But the facts say otherwise. In reality, Jesus appeared to hundreds of people after the resurrection. Also, Jesus' followers did not expect him to rise from the dead and were convinced only when given proof that he was alive. And that, you know, you get to thinking about that, that also disproves the old notion that they had invented the resurrection. Expels that, you know. A lot of people said, well, the, those... 12 that had, had, had followed him and his disciples that they, and they just invented that the whole thing about the resurrection but they actually didn't believe though they were told by Mary Magdalene and later told by the two that had met him on the road to Emmaus and they still didn't believe Jesus appeared to his disciples and rebuked them for their lack of faith in his prophesied resurrection and rebuked pretty sharply. And for their refusal to believe eyewitness testimony of the fact, after all their experiences with him seeing the proofs of his divinity and reliability of his words, that they should have believed the reports that he had risen from the dead. Folks, I mean, after all, he had plainly told them he had plainly told them that he would rise after three days. So he did rebuke them. Despite initial unbelief, the disciples would later proclaim his resurrection. Jesus commissioned them to preach the gospel to the entire world. And you know, even th there was one disciple that was not there when he came and, and proved to all of them 
And when he came in, they told him that was, of course, he, and he's, uh, his legacy now is shared in the Word of God. And, and people, what do they call him now? Thomas, what do they call him? D doubting Thomas, because he still doubted. And he told him, unless I see with my own eyes, and I place my hand in his side, and I see those scars in his hand, I'll not believe until then. But Jesus did love him enough to show him, didn't he? But despite this initial unbelief, the disciples would later proclaim his resurrection. Jesus commissioned them to preach the gospel to the entire world. Individuals are instructed to demonstrate their faith in Christ by following him in water baptism. Jesus promised those who would believe a life marked by God's supernatural blessing including the authority to cast out demons, the baptism of the Holy Spirit evidenced by speaking in tongues, protection from harm, whether Satan or from other people, and the power to heal the sick by the laying on of hands. Following Jesus' ascension to heaven, his disciples found that he was indeed still with them through the Holy Spirit, confirming his message by signs that he had promised. Because, folks, verse 20 says... That last verse says, confirming the word with signs following. If the word goes forth and there are no signs following, somebody's preaching the wrong gospel. Or not preaching the gospel because the gospel has power and the word says that his word will not return unto him void. And that's another reason that we need to have faith. When a seed is planted, we need to have faith that it'll take root and that it'll grow. And that there'll be signs following. And I may not, and it may not be, it may not be people being resurrected from the dead. And it may be. But it may just be a changed life. And a person being resurrected spiritually from the dead. Why do you think that Jesus personally appeared to Mary Magdalene? Why do you think he personally appeared to her? Well, she no doubt had worshipped him and knew who he was and had faith. Even at the time, maybe she didn't have faith if she was bringing the spices. What experiences have you had of the signs that Jesus promised to all believers? Have you had experience with these signs that it's talking about here? I know a lot of missionaries that have had literal experiences with these signs about things that were meant for their harm that just totally didn't even harm them at all. Now that word says if we drink any poison thing that it won't harm us. Sure, being filled with the Spirit. But a lot of people, I mean, there are people that has actually taken that as to mean that, oh, well, we need to be drinking poison to prove our faith. No, no, no. It says if we drink any poison thing, doesn't it? Same way with taking up the serpents, yeah. Folks, it's really an object lesson that really doesn't have much to do with reptiles. Just like happened to Paul on that little island. Where was, what island was that? When he was building a fire? Yeah. He was building a fire and he was throwing wood on the fire and it talked about that snake that stuck its head out there and bit him on the hand and they started watching him and said well he's not going to be here long God's punishing him for something but later on when they realized it didn't even affect him they thought he was a god it doesn't say, that doesn't mean that we're supposed to go out and catch as many snakes as we can and bring them to church with us <laughs> folks some people do that and actually drink strychnine and things of that nature also to prove their faith. But there's been some of them preachers die too that have done that because of the word says we're not supposed to tempt God, are we? But these are signs. Some people misinterpret. They say these sins will follow those who believe. No, it's not sins, it's signs. Our Christian faith is founded upon the love of God, demonstrated through historical events, including the incarnation and the ministry, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ. 
But the story doesn't end there. Jesus told his followers to spread the gospel to the entire world so that everyone, including you, would have a chance to know him. Then as you walk with Jesus, you can begin sharing with others the good news of Christ.